In this class we're going to look at primary data collection techniques and general methods of data collection. So we start with um, observation. Now this was not really acceptable to many people back at the early times of the early days of surveying and development of uh, surveying techniques. But throughout the 1960s and the 1970s uh, discipline areas like sociology and psychology started to use participant observation quite a lot. And now it's become quite acceptable as a form of data collection and it has got advantages. For example it takes place in a, a neutral setting. It's uh, it, it's not a contrived situation. The observer goes to the area where the event is happening, where the people are, and makes observations and records accurately his or her own observations. So it's a it's like a, a field experiment. You go to the area where the event is or the issue is and make observations. It minimizes the uh, bias as a consequence because <coughs> the interviewer or not the interviewer, sorry, uh, the observer I should say, the observer is uh, looking at the situation and recording the situation, hopefully doing it accurately and in a neutral sense not uh, putting down his or her own bias. So it tends to reduce the bias you would get with let's say an interview where the interviewer may lead the respondent down a certain way by body language or by having certain words that are uh, suggestive of certain outcomes. The disadvantages of observation, well, it's it is limited to measuring behaviour. That may or may not be a disadvantage because a lot of situations we're looking at the behaviour of people or looking at their uh, responses to situations, um, responses to a new product on the market or to a change in price or to uh, some issue, perhaps a business issue that we're primarily responsible or interested in, not responsible for, but interested in. It's a fairly time-consuming exercise uh, making observations. It's not something that is quick and easy. Uh, the person has to be there, perhaps the person has to work in the factory or in the office and be accepted, perhaps work covertly in the office so, so that they're, they're not influencing the behaviour and make the observations. So it's it may take time, maybe time consuming, and it may uh, lead to uh, it may lead to more accurate understanding if the investigator, him or herself, is not biased and they record accurately what they're seeing. <clears throat> Sorry, personal, uh, personal interview. Well, that's a technique that's used quite a lot. Um, it permits uh, in-depth questions and responses. So it's uh, it gets deeper. Uh, it minimizes non-response because if the person has been interviewed, well, they are responding. So it minimizes non-response. However, it's costly, and there is a, an interviewer or an investigator bias. The person doing the interview may, as I said earlier, use body language or uh, may use suggestive words to influence the responses in a certain direction. And in fact, the interviewer may not do this in a malicious way. It may just be a part of his or her personality or recent experiences. It could be more serious. It could be that the interviewer cheats and says they have interviewed a person when they haven't. Just get paid for nothing. So it does need 
uh, monitoring and control. Telephone interviews, well, they've got advantages. Uh, they're convenient. Pick up a telephone and phone someone. They do save time, particularly travel, so they're relatively inexpensive. You don't have to go to the person uh, to interview them. And there will be less inv investigator bias as a as a consequence uh, of telephoning because the person answering the questions can't see the body language. They are have to answer entirely based on the words that come down the telephone. So the the context of the interview, or the way that the interviewer is appearing or the interviewer's reactions to the responses, these things are missing. So there's no bias in that in that way. Um, there are disadvantages. There are a lot of people on the telephone who are not going to be interviewed, who might be relevant. Uh, it's an issue about where you find the telephone numbers. There's a, a worry about, uh, a growing worry about cold calling just calling people up and asking them their opinions. Um, it's getting a bad name because of so many companies are doing it. And people with telephones want peace and quiet. They want to enjoy life. They don't want to sit by the telephone answering a lot of questionnaire type uh, interviews. They, they don't want to sit there answering question after question. They want to look at television and enjoy themselves. <coughs> so there's a limited time for the response. If if people do agree to answering on a telephone, they don't want to sit there for hours answering either. They want to have a quick 10 minutes, maybe 5 minutes, answer a few questions. Thank you. It's over. But as I said earlier, there are issues about cold calling and it's getting it's getting a bad reputation. Self-administered questionnaires, well, the idea here is you give the questionnaires out to people and go back later and pick them up so that the people answer the questions when they have more time on their hands. It's cost-effective. You go to a large area and distribute a lot of the questionnaires and go back later and see if you can get the, the filled out ones, uh, the completed ones. It does minimise uh, interviewer bias. The interviewer is not there so there's no bias and it promotes people to try and answer the questions accurately because they're on their own and they have time to think and they try to answer it as accurately as they can. Generally speaking however it's a very low response rate. Um, given out questionnaires in an area not everybody will return the questionnaire. Um, people live their lives, they might go shopping when you go to pick it up or they might go to work or whatever, so, or they may not simply have had the time to to fill it out, or or maybe not the interest to fill it out. Let's be honest about it. And there might be a lot of unanswered questions on the form, because maybe the respondents didn't understand the questions, or maybe they felt that it was too long. The questionnaire the questionnaire was too long. It would take too long to fill it out, so they couldn't be bothered. And if it is too long, the latter part of it might be full of inaccurate answers because they don't know how to respond and they're getting bored. It's too long, just tick anything, tick that box. Now question formats, well, open-ended questions, these give the respondent the freedom to write. It's not a yes or no, it's just write out the, the answers. And the advantages are, it doesn't force people to make choices. There are many situations, many, many situations in business and in life, in, indeed, where a yes or no answer is not appropriate. It may be, it may be a maybe answer. Perhaps this or perhaps that. If this, then that. So maybe a yes or no answer is, is not appropriate. So there's a great unlimited variety of responses that are permitted under this because people can write out what they what they feel or what they think. 
the disadvantage as well it does promote investigator bias because uh, the investigator is there when it's been filled out uh, again their body language may be such as to influence the outcomes and the big disadvantage is it's difficult to code this, it's difficult to analyze it <clears throat> particularly with a large number of responses um, it's very difficult to get an overall picture it's best used in small scale as a consequence so using it in a limited sense is, is okay but not in, in a, a big questionnaire. It does require uh, having some sort of rapport with the respondent. The, the investigator and the respondent must, uh, they must have some sort of agreement between them. They must understand each other and um, it should be a comfortable exchange but not one with bias. Um, as a final question, uh, it's pretty good. It's 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 generally that's where it's 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 kept. Open-ended questions on questionnaires tend to come towards the end. Generally speaking, how do you feel about this? And have that as a as a final question. And it's also pretty good to as a way of finding facts. Uh, suggested here that age is one. Well, people answering their, their age is very personal and that may alienate respondents as well. They don't want to give their age, perhaps. So, care has to be taken with the type of open-ended questions that are posed. Close-ended or closed questions. Well, these are yes or no questions. The, the respondents are limited to positive or negative. Do you agree? Do you not agree? There's nothing in between. Um, these are, uh, minimize investigator bias. You simply pose the question and it's yes or no. The responses are obtained quickly and of course the coding is very easily done. It's very easy to analyze how many said agreed or how many disagreed or it's very easy to to do that sort of analysis it is a very simplistic way of collecting information because <coughs> excuse me as i said earlier um there's a great variety of responses to most questions and many people would say well uh if those circumstances arose the answer would be yes however if these other circumstances arose, the answer would be no. So sometimes yes and no's are conditional. They depend on something else. And but you're not giving the respondent the chance to explain that. You're just simply saying, here is the question, is it yes or no? Very, very harsh. The wording of the question itself may cause bias as well. Real care has to be made with the wording of the question. And that's why a lot of this type of work has to be piloted in advance. In other words, get it as close to the finished product as possible and then pilot it, test it out with people. These, these responses are not taken into account but just test it out with people in advance to iron out any issues to, to try and make the wording as neutral as possible. It's very good for telephone interviews, but um, what I said earlier about telephone interviews, that might be an issue about uh, the intrusion aspect of a telephone interview. Um, it's also quite good for self-administered questions. People like the idea that I can answer the question just by ticking a box. Um, so it has got advantages. Multiple choice questions. Uh, respondents are limited to a choice of more than two positions. So, <coughs> in 
if this is the question, is the answer A, B, C or D? And D could be something else, any other uh, issue. So D could be sort of almost an open-ended answer. But A, B, C, D. And hopefully people will pick one of those choices that will enable them to, to do accurate and fast coding work later on, get a, um, a definitive outcome. Closed-ended questions, uh, or closed questions, well, the advantages of multiple choice, well, um, it does minimize investigator bias, because the, question, the answers are given, so there's very little that the interviewer can do about that. But the interviewer could, of course, influence the responses to a particular answer. But that would be quite malicious to do. Uh, although it can happen without the interviewer knowing that he or she is doing it, just simply by placing greater emphasis on one of the answers. The responses are obtained quickly. Coding is simple and inexpensive. Uh, it's easy to get an overall picture and it permits a greater range of commitments than yes or no questions so a greater variety of responses could be picked up rather than simply the dichotomous yes or no um, the disadvantages well good questions are difficult to write it's, it needs careful planning in advance. So there are issues there. It, it could, be, could be difficult to deal with this one, and to, to get the question so that a certain number of answers, only those certain number of answers are appropriate. And the wording of the question could cause bias. Um, sometimes questions that start with don't you feel that the government policy in this situation is whatever? That's trying to pull the respondent along. It's biased. It's pulling the respondent along to a position that the interviewer wants. That should not happen. The question should be neutral. It should be open to the respondent to come down whichever side he or she wants not the wording leading to that. The multiple choice one is best used in personal interview for self-administered ones and in telephone ones as I mentioned earlier. Rating scales uh, these are used quite a lot when we're dealing with attitudes. If we're trying to assess people's attitudes towards something, we could use rating scales. Um, for example, trying to evaluate something. You say, is it good? Is it very good? Is it average? Is it excellent? Is it poor? Whatever. So you have a scale here, one to five. And the person's asked to rate a certain situation in terms of that. Um, this here is called a five point. I'll put the cursor onto the scale, onto the slide. Um, it's a five point scale. There is a, a bias here that a lot of people will be pulled to the centre one. It's just the way we are as people. So if you want to force them to make a decision, you wouldn't have an odd number here. You might have a, a six or a four. So if you had a six, they have to come down one side or the other. Uh, three and a half doesn't exist. It's either a three or a four. So there are issues in developing this. You could use it for frequency. Do you ever, sometimes, always, etc. Again, there's a bias there. People, well, sometimes. But if you want them to definitely come down one side or the other, you would have to have an even number of responses here. Um, 
a lot of these scales go back to Likirk, and the Likirk scale is very famous in interviewing. It's an attitudinal scale. It, it looks at issues surrounding the development of a scale that measures attitudes and the pros and cons of the scale. But um, I said it could be strongly disagree, agree, neutral, blah, blah, blah. again a five point so a lot of people might be biased towards the center and again to get rid of that bias it might be a, a situation of having an extra an extra one in have six so you're you gotta pull down one side or the other side you can't you can't go to the center these are best used for personal interviews self-administered questionnaires and telephone um, they're widely used as techniques but care has to be paid uh, to the, the downsides of using them um, simply if, if you asked a lot of people let's say in terms of intensity do you agree with whatever government policy on something and say we strongly agree well it still doesn't pick up the intensity because two people may say strongly agree but one feels very very strong and the other thinks yeah I feel strongly about it so the intensity of the response is still not being picked up here semantic differentials uh, the respondents evaluation range between opposites um, okay so what you do is you you simply say very important not important and put in a scale in between again we've got an odd number here so people may be biased towards the center you have to be careful about that it may be a six point or a four point might be better but anyway uh, we've got a five point, uh, sorry an odd number here um, semantic differential it means we, we pick one very interesting not interested very religious, not religious. Uh, negative impression, positive impression. And put in a scale in between and select which one is corresponds to the answer. Used in personal interview, in self-administered questionnaires, can be used in telephone um, interviews as well. Rankings. Uh, the respondent ranks preferences amongst uh, a group of uh, alternatives. So, what's the preference here? How would you, which do you prefer? Radio, television, newspaper, the internet? And you say, well, I prefer the radio. So that's the first. Um, television, second. Internet, third. Newspaper, fourth. Or whatever. Uh, newspaper first, television second, whatever. So you, um, you just simply circle the one that they that they say first. Well, first preference, second preference, and so on. Personal interview, uh, it's useful there and it's useful for self-administered questionnaires and for telephone uh, work as well. Um, Within, question, uh, within the questionnaire design, uh, it might be necessary to filter the responses. Um, these are questions designed to direct response to different sections of the questionnaire. Um, if you ask someone, do you believe the government is doing a good job in terms of economic policy? If they say, no, then the question, the next question, which may have been, uh, why do you like the government economic policy? Um, can you elaborate on whatever? Well, that section is not relevant because it said no. You have to jump to the part of the questionnaire that follows from that. So, within um, questionnaire design or interview design, it should be written against each question. If the response is whatever, go to section whatever, question 4, question 5 or question X, whatever it is. So the interviewer 
or the the person conducting the survey is uh, guided through the whole process with guiding notes on each question. And that gives greater uh, continuity for the respondent. It's, it makes a lot more sense. Uh, people get alienated if they say, no I don't like government economic policy on whatever. And then um, the next question is, what do you, what in particular do you like about government policy? Well, nothing. I've just said I don't like it. So why am I answering this question? So at the end of the question, this should have been directed on to find out what is it, what it is that they don't like. Um, best use is to get answers for questions that are appropriate for only part of the sample. Well, it also gives greater continuity and greater clarification and more professionalism because the respondent is getting a better experience. They're not wasting time, it's not frustrating, they're not getting upset because I've already answered that question, why are you asking me again? I've already told you I don't like it, so why are you asking me why I like it? So to avoid that situation there may be branching within the questionnaire design. So each question, at the end of the question, if the response is positive, go to question whatever. So you're missing out some questions and going there. But that gives a greater experience. Um, sorry, greater... Uh, yeah, I suppose a greater experience. Uh, a, a greater uh, sense of professionalism and the professionalism is based on the experience of the person writing it and the respondent feels that this whole exercise has been done by somebody with experience and with somebody who's done, done this before. They're, they're in charge of the situation and it's a greater feeling that it's, it's coherent, it's logical. So there are some ideas about primary data collection techniques and that concludes this class. So thank you for watching.